Did you know there are 188 biases? Well, in today's episode, it's my delight and privilege to have one of my mentors, James Lavers, on the show to talk about confirmation bias and, by the way, three other biases. You'll find out what they are, and you know, I have to tell you, <laughs> it's a real eye-opener to discover how, you know, when they operate unhealthily in you, they keep you stuck, they affect your relationship, your business, and more. Plus, in our conversation, we're going to lay out exactly how you can approach biases in a way that means they start working for you and not against you so that you can, you know, get on an upward spiral out of your current ceiling of limitation and into the stratosphere of your version of success. Well, welcome to episode 47 of the Be A Brilliant Human podcast with me, Joel Young. It's a super powered, super packed episode with James. You can find the show notes at www.beabrillianthuman.com slash 47. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you like what you hear, go and tell someone about it. Let's do it. Hit it, Kim. Welcome to the Be A Brilliant Human podcast. You're in the right place if you're a growth-seeking being who acknowledges the challenges and delights of your humanity on the path to an ever more conscious life. If you want to feel inspired to love and accept yourself, to feel free to be and express you in all your brilliance, if you want to truly value yourself and others and feel energized and alive both at home and in the world, then sit back and take a breath as you explore and grow the brilliance of your beautiful human self with your host, the father of non-personal awareness and creator of the MPA process, Joel Young. All right, all right. I am here with the main man, James Lavers. I am so delighted, James, that you're on this show. This show would not be probably, what are we, 40 plus episodes in if it wasn't for you. Um, those of you who've been on this show for some time will have known that James gets mentioned pretty much every five to six episodes, uh, certainly on the first one because I did his... Um, you know, start a podcast course. It was a day course and the lunchtime homework because James does implementation. That's why I love James. He does implementation and kicks ass. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, your homework is to do episode number one. And I'd been thinking about doing a podcast for, I don't know, fucking years. And uh, I did it. It was called My Commitment to Imperfection and it was certainly imperfect, but it kept me going. And here we are. And since then, I've done a lot of work with James and I'm still working with James. He's helped me an enormous amount in my business. And he's a no fluff monster, which is great. <laughs> um, a marketing expert specifically working with people uh, like you. So I'm guessing that um, there's a good chance listening to this podcast that you're someone who um, not only works on themselves, but may well be someone who works in the industry, whether you help others in whatever way. James is your guy. I'll tell you now. He's your guy because um, he, he specializes in that. Anyway, I'm telling his story. Uh, welcome, James. I'm off on one. Uh, oh, before, before I let you speak, I fair warning. <laughs> James is also King Ranter. Uh, we both go off on one. Who knows where go, this could we go? We both go off on one. We do indeed. And I love that. I love him for that. Um, today, we're going to talk about confirmation bias. But James, say hello and tell us a bit about, yeah, give us your version of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. I've um, I've been a big admirer of your work, man. So it's 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 both ways. I think the work you're doing is so important, and I feel like <clears throat> every client that I work with. So I work with coaches, trainers, authors, speakers, thought leaders, experts, and these could be people who are started. They're later in life, and they're starting a second wind. You know, they're getting a second wind to start sharing their expertise their experience, the things they've learned in life and turning that into like a, like an expert business. <clears throat> Some of them, uh, you know, I'll work with people who are already established big names, who's, you know, best selling personal development or professional performance books you can get in the, the local bookstore and everyone in between really, because what I'm helping people to do is to translate their message into, and to, to really turn their expertise into products and programs and, and, and uh, uh, services that can be delivered online to the world and, and presenting them powerfully, you know, through, through the internet, through video, 
So I'm, at the end of the day, to make it easy for everyone listening to this, at the end of the day, I'm a salesman. <laughs> yeah. I, come from a, I come from a background in home shopping TV and the infomercial industry. Only I had a chance encounter, Joel, as you well know, I had a chance encounter to work as an infomercial producer with Tony Robbins. And I was, I was very good at selling fake diamonds and food processors and, and ab crunchers and vacuum cleaners and all those kind of things. And when this chance to help Tony Robbins, who had helped me, you know, I'd, I'd gone through one of his programs as a teenager and it had helped me get over my blushing problem. Um, and so when I got the chance to work with Tony and actually give back to him to advise him and it had this immense result for him where I did one show with him and it more than doubled his sales previously, you know, his sales record. And, um, and it was that moment, this was 2003. And um, it was that moment that made me go, hang on a minute. I could be using these skills I've got, not just to flog items that, you know, are optional, but actually, you know, to, 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 to help people, you know, to, I could be using my skills to help the people help us. That's how you and I, you know, ended up working together. But, you know, you do this amazing work, uh, especially what you've, you, uh, funnily enough, people obviously won't have heard what we were talking about before we came on. Yeah. But just to, just to uh, put the spotlight on you again, Joel's just really helped me, like with a, a boundary issue that I just recently went through um, just a few days ago. And just in a few sentences, you've helped me understand what happened there in a way that kind of put me back at ease and helped me understand that, like, no, when you're defending your boundaries and when you are saying, no, that's not okay, this is okay, you know, when you start doing that at a really high level, which when you're as busy as me and busy as us, all of us are, you have to be, right? You have to have your boundaries in place. Um, Sometimes when you start doing it, it can feel really odd. Like it can feel really weird. It's not, it's not the best feeling in the world, you know, like saying no and going, that's not going to happen. That's not okay. Um, and I think the work you're doing is amazing. So really my job is just to help people like you, uh, people like us to, to communicate that online in a way that grows our fan base, allows us to reach people around the world, you know, that we otherwise wouldn't reach um and using the internet to do that easily you know in a way that isn't all drama and stress absolutely and you do it brilliantly thank um, you really really good so yeah and and you're right about feeling uncomfortable it's it's one of the things that i see with people and one of the reasons i created boundary boot camp a because i had really shit boundaries and i went the slow way <laughs> the slow messy way but out of that kind of got a sense of well there's a path <clears throat> i could lay out in a easy to follow way but that discomfort is part of the course is, is when you do, especially if you haven't held good boundaries. And, you know, we were talking about a bit about this before is like you can have good boundaries in one area of your life and shit boundaries in another area of your life. It's 100%. certainly the case. Um, but when you do do that, then you're going to meet resistance. And part of the course is how to deal with the resistance when it comes up and yes. understand um, there's a lot of tricky techniques that people use not consciously necessarily, because it's kind of entrained within our culture that these are perfectly normal ways of behaving. Um, mm -hmm. But when you really can see um, what the game is, how to not play that game, or at least know how to play the game better in a way that supports you, then you're really armed once you've got strong boundaries to actually hold them in the face of it, which is, I, you know, I'm going to go off on one here, but I, it's such a passion for me. Um, yeah. having lived in, in a, an experience of really having no boundaries and also going through, we might get into this the, with the spirituality. There's a lot of things in spirituality which use confirmation bias and stuff like that for um, to basically fuck up your boundaries. <laughs> you know, there's some ideas in there that just yeah. that, that tell right. you that if you're spiritual, then you have no boundaries. You know? The, 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 I like even the fact, I think there's gold even in the idea that it can be a game. You said that it's like, a, you know, if you understand the game. And I think that in and of itself can help. Because for many, I think for me, to understand that like, yeah, this is serious, like what's okay and what's not okay. But like you can operate as if this is a game. And I find if you do that, exactly as you say, I find that very comforting. 
because it helps me to at least go, ah, oh, I won that round. No, I'm doing good. You know, and like if you <laughs> if you if you mess up, it's okay. That doesn't mean the entire game you can't play the game again. You know. So I really like that metaphor that you just said there because it does it helps you go like <clears throat> actually no, it's okay. I just do better in the next round. I'll do better. That's really key, I think. It is, and all, and also having. A, a, Playing or having a game, one of the key mindsets in the program is playfulness. Um, and I love that about you as well, because I mean, you can be like ruthless, like part, part of one of the, the programs that I've done with James uh, has critiques in it. And um, he's absolutely roasting my work and then laughing his head off. And I'm laughing along with him because A, he's right. You know, it's like, hello, busted. Um, but B, there's that sense of humor. And I've been reviewing because yeah. we're launching again. It's like, uh, been reviewing the content of Bound, and I'm talking about some strong stuff, and I'm laughing my head off. Yeah, <laughs> humor's so important, though. Humor is so. I wish if there were one kind of. I've really thought about this, Joel. Like, what would I if there was one change I could make to the industry? And sometimes I, you know, some people would call for it to be regulated. Some people would call for that. And I'm like more humor, more and more sense of humor, especially with some of the people in visible with visible status, you know, some of the, the, the key thinkers. I think the ability, I don't think we can really change as easily until we're laughing at ourselves. Like it's, it's only at the point where I go, ah, you idiot, that like I get all of this learning suddenly. Whereas if I'm taking transformation, like you say, the spirituality world is, is definitely... I mean, I'm grouping a lot of people into a big old industry there, but you know, the, definitely one of the things that it that it is, can be healthily accused of is of taking itself very seriously. And the problem there is transformation. I don't think flows very well when everyone's taking it very seriously. It's not until we can laugh at ourselves and the, what asses we're making of ourselves that I think we can't really change. Do you know what I mean? Like. You can, but it, it makes it a lot clunkier, a lot harder. And I, th I think we all need to learn to laugh at ourselves, laugh at our clients. You know, I get a cute, I, I, funny enough, as we're saying this, just last night I got, a, I got a message on Facebook from a client just saying, thank you so much because um, I've spent a lot of time round, and I won't name and shame, but a particular group of type of coaching, like a school of coaching, and it takes itself very seriously, very seriously. <clears throat> and um, he said, I've found I've changed so much quicker with you roasting me, as you say. But it's, it's done, the thing is, it's done in the right spirit. You know, because really all you're doing when I'm roasting my clients, which, by the way, for anyone listening, it doesn't mean I'm not insulting people. No. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm poking fun at the ridiculousness of it all. And it's not until we can laugh and really see it's not until we can laugh at the ridiculousness, the, the, the ridiculous things we do, that we actually can see them and be like, oh my God, what am I doing? You know? Um, and so I, I love it. So it's, it's roasting in good, it's roasting in good humor. It's showing people where they're being ridiculous. Um, and, and I think we all need a bit of that. Absolutely. That, that's been my experience. It, it's definitely done with, with great heart and humor. And, um, you know, laughter is the lubricant, right? So, <laughs> yeah, totally. totally. And, uh, and also, you know, we're going way off the script here, but it's like, again, you did a live about, um, you know, comedy and the, the link between comedy. And I've always thought that, that, you know, the, the divine jester is, and the comedian is someone who says things that everyone's ignoring. And yeah. that's a tremendous, with humor, and there's a tremendous gift in that. And he, he or she gets it in, that archetype gets it in through the back door. Yeah. It's why nowadays we're in a time now, um, when you look at some of the great influencers now, they're comedians. You look at somebody like Joe Rogan and his podcast, he's the new Oprah. You know, so we're 20, 30, we're probably going about 30 years now. Oprah was the, she would bring into people's homes brilliant thinkers you know to begin with she would just interview celebrities but then latterly certainly in the last 20 25 years of you know the oprah winfrey show she would be bringing some of the great thinkers 
into her studio and getting them into people's homes that way. Nowadays, it's coming in through YouTube, and only the 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 gatekeepers to that aren't the journalists. Now they're the comedians. You know, they're the entertainers. So exactly as you say, the kind of there's something about that divine jester that manages to to get get things maybe we need to be looking at in through the back door. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So, right, so we're going to get back on script now. We were going to talk about right information bias. I'll tell you, it's just funny how this came about. So I've been on a, a group coaching program with James and some amazing people, and um, we'll often get into these, 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 these side topics come up, and they're brilliant. They're really perfect. And James went off on one about, in a good way, hearted way, <laughs> about confirmation bias. But it was brilliant, and I thought that's a really good topic for the podcast. And funnily enough, the interesting thing, the other part of that, that, that discussion on that afternoon um, was about stepping up and asking and sort of having what James called six seconds of bravery. And I thought, well, mm. I've been thinking about asking James to come on the show, so I'm going to try my six seconds of bravery and said, well, will you come on the podcast and, you know, talk about confirmation bias, you know, after everything else we just talked about, obviously. <laughs> so, so, but it is a fascinating topic. So I think so. I guess... And one thing that, that you shared with me just before we came on this call was that there's actually four biases or bi biases. How do you say that? Biases. Um, but, yeah. What's the plural? Which is, you know, um, fascinating. So I'm going to try and uh, pull that out of you. So first of all, confirmation bias. What the fuck is that? What are you talking about? Confirmation bias is one of about 188 cognitive biases. Now, the way I think of what a bias is and by the way before before i go any further i have to say i'm not a scientist i'm not a mathematician i'm not an academic um i barely have an a level uh, you know advanced level educational certificate to my name um i came to biases through the commercial group so i came to biases as how people talk themselves out of things or into things and how we lie to ourselves so they're like filters and I've come to them through sales, through when, when you learn a great deal when you're selling like 24 hours a day on a shopping channel like QVC, which is available around the world, you know, you, you learn a lot in the position that I was in about how people will talk themselves into or out of buying or making buying decisions. And I, when I took that online to help people like us, um, I saw it a lot in my clients in how they would approach things like selling, things that they were uncomfortable with. So I see biases very differently. You'll hear a very different explanation if you ask a scientist or a neuroscientist or something like that. So there's no scientific basis to my perspective on it. Biases are how we bullshit ourselves. They're how we convince ourselves of things. It's how we filter information coming in and also in some ways outgoing information as well. Um, and I was first exposed to, um, so there's 188 of these things. Wow. There's four that I'm particularly interested in confirmation bias being probably the most, the one that most people will be most familiar with when I, when I talk about it, it'll sort of ring bells for most people and confirmation bias is basically where we filter incoming information uh, or things we've been exposed to in order to confirm something we already knew or to confirm a stunt. I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you an example from my business and I'll give you a popular example as well. But there's three others that I wanted to talk about because I think these are very close. They're all kind of close relatives of the same type of bias, right? So there's also um, outcome bias. And uh, I would describe outcome bias as being like, um, if, if I make a good decision, uh, if I make a decision that leads to a good outcome, that means the decision was good. Likewise, if I make a decision that leads to a bad outcome, that means the decision was bad, right? Love now, it. again, a, a lot of this, so that's a, that's a, a, a potentially hazardous bias right and the, the the third one is hindsight bias this is another one that i see most commonly along with confirmation bias hindsight bias is i knew it all along i knew that would happen 
I knew that would happen. That's hindsight bias. And um, and then the the, uh, the 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 last one that I think is is people are particularly at risk of is the self serving bias. Right. right? So self serving bias it could be best described as <clears throat> when good things happen, I take the credit. When bad things happen, that's some other bugger's fault. Right? Right, yeah. So it's our tendency to uh, take the credit for things when things are going well and to blame somebody else when things are going bad. Yeah, now, any that. coaches <laughs> and therapists out there, if you've ever had ab reactions, and I don't mean acute ab reactions, if you've ever had a client turn on you, when you're working with them over a period of time, and I've had this happen multiple times, and I'll always bring up self-serving bias. Um, if you've ever had a client, you know, and like things go, go well, and then, you know, some way through the program, if you're doing, I don't know, a month with somebody, else, so usually it happened when you're working with somebody over a longer period of time. Well, when things start to take a, a turn for the worst, that's on you, coach. That's on you, therapist. That's on you, trainer. You know, when things go well, that was me, actually. You didn't, you, you maybe had a little hand in that, but no, I'll take the credit for that one. You see what I mean? So self-serving bias as well. So these four work, I think, to keep us in a, the best way I would think of it is a, a place of stasis where we're not really moving. These are, these four can really, um, stilt transformation they can stagnate change and where i first encountered it was when i was training people to use video going back a decade ago um, when video online still wasn't like as commonplace as it is now and as familiar and as part of all our daily lives that is as it is now youtube had only been going for you know three or four years and um you know you couldn't live stream the way we can now we can all just with a few taps go live on our phones, you know, for goodness sake, it's crazy. Um, and what I, people knew intrinsically that they, they would probably benefit from having some videos, for example, on their website. You know, like if I'm going to work with you, it, it might, it might help for me to see what you're like. Right. And so people would, would have a go, but they would come to it with their biases, right? So they were uncomfortable with the idea of doing video. They were scared. Maybe they'd look silly or that they'd mess it up and all these kind of things. And I started to see this phenomenon, Joel, right, where people would have a go at it and never get any further than just having a go at it in spite of obviously amazing training from me, <laughs> in spite of that. And I started to get, number one, scared because I was like, maybe I suck as a trainer. And the, there was some truth to that. And number two, um, maybe there's something on, going on in people. So that led me on a journey to really learn much more about biases. And what I found out was, actually, I probably did suck as a trainer because I didn't have anything that would, would reconcile these biases that would come up as people were doing something new and alien and uncomfortable. And I had no way other than to be like, do it, just do it. And so what happens is, when people it's you might think of it as like dipping the toe and then go oh no i don't want to go in there you know and it's like that's another way that biases work they kind of keep us and go no no that that feels cold you only dip your toe in you know and so people would do that so i'd see a lot of um hindsight bias and a lot of confirmation bias yeah people would make a video nobody would watch and they'd go well i knew that would happen video is just not my thing and what that did was that strengthened the confirmation bias that, like, I was right all along. And so then all that did was it strengthened their current position. So now the next time that person maybe needed to approach video, they were even more stuck in that position. And that's where confirmation bias comes in and where it can be deadly, really. To businesses, in my experience, it can be deadly because it, it keeps people in this rigidity. That's where we need a lot of we need a lot of humor to shake that up. It's the only way. You can show people that they have these biases and you can make them laugh at them. And if you could do that, that's the start. And that's what I had to learn, Joel, real fast, was like how to use humor in my work and how to, how to show people their own biases without, without it just reinforcing them, you know, so that they could actually go, oh, yeah, yeah, I see this little, these little loops that I'm talking myself into. 
And it happened to me because um, I was a terrible liar. When you work in shopping telly, you know, the, you, sometimes you were, and I don't want to discredit any particular product, but sometimes you would be representing and selling on air, you know, on live TV to hundreds of thousands of people, a product that was, quite frankly, horseshit. And I had to sort of convince myself. If I, if I was going to work as the producer of that show, I had to get myself to a place where, no, this, this is not a piece of shit product. This is a great product, you know. And so I got very good at lying to myself and lying to others. That's the truth of it. And so the work with biases really came out from studying what is it when we convince ourselves of things? What is going on there? And, that, and so all the bias stuff came out of that. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the thing where it really connects for me and with this podcast. It's, it's be a brilliant human. It's about growing. And it, it's something that I've seen as, I mean, you use the word loop. That's what I see. It's what keeps people in the loop, going around in circles, the same old thing. Yes. I, I did mention it, um, I think it was episode 44. Um, well, around, around capitulating on your boundaries, we talked about that before we came on. So what we'll do is we'll set a boundary and then uh, there'll be some resistance. We'll capitulate, which ultimately feels really crap inside. But then we'll use the confirmation bias to, through the route of rationalization, which I'm guessing is similar to the sort of what they, when it comes to sales, you buy something, then you use rationalization to say why it was a good thing. Um, yeah. But rationalization says, oh, it's not so bad, or um, it was right to not to capitulate because otherwise, blah, 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 blah. All of those things are basically just say bullshitting yourself um, to... Um, to justify the capitulation rather than facing the pain of capitulation. And what it does is exactly as you say, it creates that loop where you end up then that capitulation uh, again, reduces your self-esteem and your trust of yourself. Then the justification um, buries it again, which puts you back in the same circle again. You're lucky to do it again, which again, ekes away and ekes away at that self-esteem, self-trust, all the rest of it. And it usually, you usually with confirmation bias, to pick up on what you're saying there, is like the confirmation bias, you're usually starting with some kind of premise, with something that you want confirmed. So people that, for example, have been, um, and obviously this isn't, this isn't really much of a laughing matter, but say, for example, people that have suffered abuse, whether emotional, physical, whatever, they may come to future relationships with a, with, um, and listen, and, and we'll get into this more, but like confirmation bias, none of these biases come from a bad place. No. Like they all have a positive intent. But like say that if you've suffered from abuse <clears throat> and then you might, uh, let's just say you're in a heteronormative relationship and you're a, a woman who suffered abuse and you start dating again, you might have a, um, an idea in your mind, let's call it that, that is men are not to be trusted. Let's just say, for example, I'm using obviously a very crude example here that's outside of my realm of expertise, but I think it's a good example. Um, you might have an idea like that, that men are not to be trusted. And so what happens is confirmation bias is like a pair of spectacles. That like the minute you put it on, you are, it's uh, what the thinker thinks, the prover proves. That is very much what confirmation bias is like. So uh, these specs will look for anything where you can't be trusted. So I don't think men can be trusted. And you might go out, you might start dating again. And the thing is, you'll now be looking for evidence that you can't be trusted. You need that confirmed. And yeah. so you're now no longer coming at a place or a, a, like an expansive starting point. You are now, the date is filtered through, you can't be trusted. So I'll be looking at everything. So if you're a minute early or a minute late, for example, I might go, see, can't be trusted. Yeah. Can't be trusted. You were, you were early. We said seven o'clock. Why would you come early? Why would you come early? That's weird. Like, and everything starts to go through these lenses of confirmation bias that go, yeah, oh, okay, there we go. And because oftentimes this bias will come into play to keep us safe, you know, to keep us from, from doing risky behaviors from doing things that might, and obviously personal transformation, 
I mean, I deal with business transformation, but personal transformation, business, relationship transformation, any way you're looking to grow and change, there's risk involved. There's risk involved. Confirmation bias is a way of unconsciously putting on a filter that stops you risking and just simply confirms current position. That's what confirmation bias does. It says, no, you were right. You're good where you are. Don't know. You're good. You know? Yeah, don't change. It goes back again. We cover this in the Boundary Boot Camp about survival strategies. It really is sort of really old, very young, usually um, survive. And they're called survival strategies for a reason. Because even though we live in a, you know, a civilized world, um, you know, our bodies still take it as life or death threat. You know, it's like your life depends upon, um, you know, playing nice in a family, especially if you have like, you know, aggressive father or mother or, or, or whatever the situation is. And it gets set up in that way. And that's where exactly as you say, confirmation bias comes in and, and you prove yourself right. And the, and the, the funny thing of course, about this with your specs on, um, is that we're human. And, uh, you know, this show is all about the humanity of it, right? You know, the, the ideal is you wouldn't say it, but anyone who's human will always give you the evidence you seek. They will, because they're human. There will yeah. be something to find. And, and again, with the weight of that confirmation, I love the way you said it, you need confirmation of something. When there's that need for confirmation, it can be like you said, tiny one minute late. You know, this guy's been perfect. You know, he's the absolute gen. He's been reliable. He's taken the bins out when he sees take the bins out. You know, he's he's turned up on time for most of the dates or all of the dates so far. One time, one minute late. Yes. That's it. Can never That's trust it. him. <laughs> I knew it. I knew and then it. Hindsight bias comes in. I knew it all along. Yeah. So then that reaffirms the confirmation. So hindsight bias comes in and says. Uh, knew it all along, and do you know what? I was right to be suspicious. So my decision to begin with. So that's when self-serving comes in as well, you know, and all these things. And it's um, they all kind of work together to keep you where you are. Because I do think, you know, there's a part of our brain that just goes, look, <clears throat> when it comes to how do we stay alive tomorrow, whatever we did yesterday kept us, worked well enough to keep us alive till today. So today I'll do what I did yesterday. And then tomorrow I'll probably do what I did today as well. Like it's just, it's all designed to keep us, you know, the idea of growth and pushing boundaries and going beyond our comfort zones is actually a relatively new idea. You know, we haven't really started talking about this. I know it's been talked about in various disciplines, ancient, you know, when you look back in certainly in, uh, in and you, you look east as well at some of the, the thinking disciplines. But in terms of in our westernized culture and our capitalist societies, uh, the idea of going beyond your comfort zone is really a, a post-war. You know, this is a relatively new idea that you should, no, you can go beyond and you be can become more than you ever thought possible. And it's like, this is 70 years old. This is a new idea. Yeah. yeah really. And also, again, the thing with, with the transformational or growth of any kind, it, it's about sort of disassembling what has been, which means there's a chaos phase, which means there's discomfort. And I, you know, if I go back to what you said about dipping your toe in the pool, you know, I knew it was going to be cold. But if you're going to get in a pool, you've got to get in. <laughs> and yes, you're going to be cold until everything sort of settles and, and becomes normal. And then you, it's a way, it feels fine. Yeah. It's fine in here. Come in, join me in my <laughs> But, you know, but again, I see that a lot in, you know, like you say, if, if, if someone's working with you, you know, as a client and they, they hit that tricky stuff, sometimes people can just, the confirmation bias kicks in, they yeah. get scared and it's totally understandable because it is, you know, anyone who does, you know, really dives into any kind of, whether it's business transformation or personal transformation, it's, it takes balls. It takes. Yeah. You know, really and does. it's not, I don't think it's about removing biases. You can't, as you say so eloquently like we're human you can't you can't these biases are there for a reason they were they were hardwired in long before our, our longest remembered ancestors what we can do is we can train ourselves and it's not the most comfortable thing but we can train ourselves to when the risk is tolerable 
<laughs> we can train ourselves to have these, what I call them, you know, six seconds of bravery. Because that's what it needs. When you're dipping your toe in, you're dipping your toe in, you're dipping your toe in metaphorically in life, you need six seconds of bravery to jump in the pool. Right? And it's not something you can imagine doing when all you're doing is dipping your toe in the water. But when, you know, if, if that same metaphor were lava, obviously those six seconds are, are going to result in your demise. So it's not about doing idiotic things. But when, when the risk is tolerable, when the downside of the risk is tolerable. So in the case of, well, what would, what's the worst that happens if you do just jump in the pool? I'll be cold and it will be shocking and I'll be wet and I won't like it. Well, okay. Oh, well, that's a tolerable risk. It doesn't lead to suffering. It's not a risk that leads to undue suffering if it goes the wrong way, you know? And I always say in those instances, that's where six seconds of bravery because I think you can do, you can take most pivotal actions in about six seconds whether that's telling somebody, no, actually, I don't want that to happen in the case of the kind of work you're doing. Uh, it, with business, six seconds of bravery to, for example, if you want to ask somebody to give you their details or to buy your product, it really only takes six seconds of bravery to say, you know, I really want you to get on board this product I've got. Let's do this. Take six seconds. Yeah. And, um, you know, without those six seconds of bravery, you might, you may stay trapped in this kind of like, oh, I hate the bit where I have to ask somebody to buy my product. And you'll stay trapped in it. And then the bias afterwards, I hated that video. Video's just not my thing. And all the bias is coming to play. I'm just not going to do it. And then your business stays where it is. That's it. Well, you don't add, you don't add online sales through video to your, to your wealth, to, your, you know, to, to what your company's making, all because of those biases. You can't stop the biases. I wish there were a switch. You could just switch them off. You can't. Uh, and that's probably a good thing, quite honestly. Uh, it probably means that we can assess risks with, a, with, a, with better thinking. What we can do is we can go, what's the downside if I, if I do believe that there is something beyond what I currently am comfortable with? And what if I just trust that for six seconds? You know, um, And I think that's how we can mitigate against biases a little bit, you know? Or we could start to at least. Yeah, I and I want to really take a massive highlighter pen out and slap it across that six seconds of bravery. Um, just in that sentence, you are reducing risk. You're making it manageable in the mind, which is which is such an amazing thing. So, you know, dear listener, pay attention to that because if whatever it is that you're facing, transformational business, whatever, if you can say what what is the six seconds of bravery I'm here you know, mm -hmm. I can do because most of the time in my experience, whatever those fears are being shored up by whatever confirmation bias is going on is bullshit anyway. And it, and most, and, and again, I love it. The sort of question I'd ask is, you know, again, what's the worst that could happen? You know, what's really mm -hmm. going to happen? What's real? Here? And, and most of the time, really nothing bad, even if it does go, you know, tits up, it's going to be not as bad as, as your mind might tell you. Mm. But just that, that is like a, for the most of us, our minds can handle what you're describing. We can handle six seconds. Yeah. I could probably. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, I, well, it's like, I used this just a few days ago. I, you know, I had to say no to somebody that I really care about, you know, and I had to say no. And, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to say no. I wanted to go like, Oh, all right then. You know, this links to the to the amazing work you're doing, Charlie. You know, and it was like we were talking about this just before we came on, and it's but it took six seconds to just go no, and then not justify myself, just be quiet, and just let that sink in with the person. Six seconds of bravery, but it it it, it worked, and it's sort of um, yeah, it's it's about now. I could have if I hadn't taken that six seconds of bravery, I my biases would have been going on overdrive. You know, and I would have been, I would have been reinforcing certain ideas that, that might not be that healthy. You know, I might have just been going like, oh, why do I, why do you always do that? You know, so because sometimes the, 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 the dangerous confirmation biases are the ones we do for ourselves, the way we, we lie to ourselves. So I might have come out of that and gone, James, you're such a, you know, some expletive. You know, you're such an idiot. You're such a weak-willed idiot. Why do you always do that? And I know that my confirmation bias would have been like, see, because we usually have ideas. So confirmation bias is positive and negative. If you've got background ideas about yourself, you know, like 
you know, maybe I've got one that's like, yo, oh, you're so weak willed when it comes to this situation. And I've got an idea. Well, what the thinker thinks, the prover will prove. That's confirmation bias. So you think that, I'm going to prove it to you. Look, yeah. you said yes to that person. You see, confirmation bias, you are weak willed when it comes to this situation with this person. You see, confirmation bias. And it's yeah. like, it, it's, uh, you've got to be careful those things that you are looking to confirm. I, I actually, this, I tell you when this, this, this came to me most starkly was I did a lot of work, Joel, with um, skincare companies. So I worked with Elemis, which is the UK's leading spa skincare brand, and Declior, which is a Parisian big conglomerate uh, skincare company, and uh, Bare Essentials, are a makeup company. And what we found was um, the self-talk, um, these companies do a lot of research into like how women, the women's relationship with themselves and their skin and the products that they're using, all these kind of things, you know. And I, I was working with these companies to help them just sell their products better on TV and on online video. But they were sharing me some of the research. And what came out was like what, that some of these things that women think about themselves when they're putting on makeup, when they're putting on their face creams and some of the terrible, terrible things that they say to themselves that you wouldn't say to your worst enemy, you know, just the, the critical, the hypercritical stuff. And then what they'll do is they'll go through the day confirming that. Yeah. You know, and, and usually that happens when they're then taking the makeup off. They're like, Oh, look at you, you know, and it's just like, so, and they'll look around. And so then they've got magazine media, you know, with, beautiful airbrush models on the cover and that just acts as more confirmation. Yeah. You see, you're not, I'm not like them, you know, and they're, they're already. So it, I always, uh, Jim Rohn said this, that, uh, you know, you've got to stand guard at the doorway of your mind. And I think this links to confirmation bias is because what are the ideas that you're just letting in through that doorway to your mind about yourself? Because whatever those ideas are, your brain will look to confirm them. And that's confirmation bias's job, is whatever you think about yourself, your brain will look to confirm that. So if you think you're a loser or some version of that, your brain will confirm that. See what a loser I am with women. See what a loser I am with guys. See what a, oh, you see what a loser I am when it comes to business. You know, everything you do will just look to confirm that. And so you'll almost deliberately, this is where sabotage comes in, right? Absolutely, People just yeah. sabotage stuff. Yeah just to confirm an idea. So I'm like, it all starts, all these biases, it all starts with an idea. And that's where confirmation bias can be used positively. You've got a great idea about yourself. Like, you know what? I'm gifted. I have something important to share with the world. Great. Then your mind will go, that's the idea we're working on here? Because I'm going to look to confirm that. Yes, it is. Great. Let's go get them, you know. And uh, yeah, these are, these are such important ideas. Yeah, I think, again... We, when I touched on the sort of boundary capitulation, that's something I realize is, is a big part of it is most of the confirmation is that you don't matter, you know, you're invisible anyway, you know, yeah. you're, you know your opinions, thoughts and feelings um, don't matter, basically. A lot of it is I don't matter. And again, you raised earlier sort of sexual abuse. I don't know if I've talked to this about you. Yeah, I've mentioned it on the show, but I had experience when I was seven of sexual abuse. And from that, most of my really shitty relational experience with lots of abusive relationships in different ways with terrible, terrible boundaries was probably confirming the I don't matter idea. Um, I'm not worthy of love or all mm -hmm. that. Again, as you said, like in, in the situation, because it was with the woman. So it was like, again, the, the, the trustability of women and, and women having more control and, you know, there's lots of things which I confirmed through what I saw that put me in a very vulnerable situation again and again. And also, mostly for me, it was, again, because of no boundaries or having really shitty boundaries, mm. staying in situations which were horribly unhealthy until over time it sort of, well, loads of work, but eventually um, it was like I had a, I had a crystallizing event where... Um, at the end of it, I'd, I had a very narcissistic relationship and at the end where, you know, she was really trying, using all the tricks of the trade to sort of hook me back in. I'd been hooked in again and again and again. And this one moment, just, just something in me just broke in the best possible way where I saw how 
um, the, there's a tangling up that happens with sexual abuse in particular, where the pleasure of the sex and then the domination and control get fused together in a very confusing way, which shoves the instincts down. In that moment, it's like I saw the knot. I was like, this is why in Boundy Boot Camp, there's a whole, whole week is untangling the knots because it literally was like, this knot and despite of all the years of work I'd done and everything else I couldn't I couldn't break that link which was no doubt again confirmation bias left right and center but when it snapped it was like holy shit <laughs> I'm dude I am so with you I, I've had <clears throat> not the same but very similar experiences on the relationship front and um, it, you know it's uh, I had the idea for many years Again, I can't emphasize enough. I only ever talk about this. Well, it's nice to have this conversation with you, actually, because I only ever really talk about these biases in a business context, you know, where they're affecting somebody's livelihood or their, you know, the amount of money they're making, those kind of things, which are really important things. But they, they, we, we, we're often able to make a separation there. But sometimes others less well than other, you know, others, but... It, this is where I think biases really come in. Like I had, and it all starts with the idea. What's the idea? Yeah. What's the idea you had? I had this idea that I'm abandoned, right? So James Labors gets abandoned, right? And, and especially the more you get to know me, if you fully get to know me, you're definitely abandoned. And so when you've got an idea like that, and this is why I would always say with people, like you've got to do almost like, um, like an audit. You know what I mean? And just be like, and it's very hard to, and I think this is where, again, the personal development world maybe do a disservice to, to this particular aspect of work is oftentimes when people write stuff down, like what are your beliefs? They don't really do the work, you know, the quote unquote, the work, you know, the deep work. And I find that if you do the deep work, you can really find some of these little unconscious loops that are running, you know, and I had, I had this one that I still battle with, you know, that's like abandoned. And then what I found was that that would put me in, in, in business. I'm an alpha dog, right? <laughs> I'm like ruling from my tower. And in relationships, I always found there was a massive disparity where I was, I felt like a victim. And it wasn't until I really looked at that and did some work around that. Um, that uh, and you know that's why you got to you know you got to that's why p things like you you're doing like with boundary boot camp are invaluable because people you can't can't do it on your own it's always very difficult I would say it takes a lot longer and it's very difficult to do it on its own why because of your biases your biases will stop you seeing it right because their only job is to prove the, the idea and so anything that it, it, it I suppose this is what I do I've got a reputation for being an ass kicker and what it is is it's not that it's just I can see it clearly. Whereas when you have an idea about, in my case, when I'm working with people, something to do with their business or making products or communicating on video or selling or, you know, building a fan base. The point is when you're, when you do the work on your own, you can avoid seeing the ideas. Some of these toxic, freaking ideas that we have going on. For me, it was one around abandonment, you know, with, uh, People, if they get to know me, especially in intimate relationships, in fact, exclusively in intimate relationships, if you know me, you'll abandon me. You'll walk away, you know. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until I really, you know, you've got to go to the root of that first. Where does that come from? My mum left me when I was uh, not not in a, you know, a horrible way, but she split off from my dad when I was two, and she left. You know, first, my dad left, and then my dad came back after a year, and they swapped. So then I went to, with my dad, and my mum left for a year. And it was just like, oh. And then... Um, Double up idea stuff. Right? And oftentimes we'll get the we'll inherit these ideas at a young age that'll just they'll be it's almost like that film Inception. I think there is no I love that film. Yeah, it's one it's my number one favourite film in the world. Right. And I'm like, there's no coincidence there. Is that because that's about how how one idea can come to make you or ruin you, you know. And I think that's the thing is is we have to be really you have to do the work, people. You know, so when people want to do the work on their businesses, that's why they'll come and get coaching with me is because it's like, look, you can't, you probably can't see these ideas that you've got. And so firstly, we have to see them and we have to, this, that's where the humor comes in, right? We have to laugh at the, it wasn't until I laughed at the origin of my abandonment issue 
which felt very raw, right? But it was like, isn't it hilarious? Your dad pisses off for a year because he's got to get work while your mum looks like Then your mum comes back and they did that. It wasn't until I could chuckle at that, at yeah. the very least, you know, just be like, mm. yeah, of course, of course, of course you'd feel like that. Who wouldn't? Yeah, you know, it's like, who, who's going to look after me now? You know, and it's just like, I thought you guys loved me. What's going on? You know, and it wasn't until I was laughing at that that I started to be able to chip away at the idea. And then, um, because prior to that, when I left a relationship, it wasn't a, a mutual breaking up. It was always, they've abandoned me. They've abandoned me. See, I'm the victim of abandonment over and over. And it wasn't until I got over that uh, that I started to, be able to make better choices, both in the relationships and also ending them as well, you know. And it, it's the same in business. It's the same anywhere, you know. It's like, what's the idea that we're starting with? And a lot of people in our industry, as you know, Joel, you know, oftentimes they are sharing deep work like you're doing, man, you know, with like working with people and boundaries. But there's a lot of people that are coming into this, you know, industry you know, as therapists, as counsellors, as carers, as coaches, and they um, they want to help people. And a lot of it is because they haven't had a voice. And now they're developing and they're looking to take that courage to help others with something that could, could really be a service to people. And so a lot of people come into this industry with worthiness challenges because they have ideas. Like, I'm not good enough. That's a big one. You know, I'm not good enough. Yeah, and like, why would anybody listen to me? Even though they'll go on the training course and they'll learn the thing, they'll still have an idea underneath it. But why would anyone look at listen to me? And this is the risk when you're a when you're a guru like me. Clearly, you know, but, <laughs> but when you're an expert, the the challenge is that the people will look up to you. That's the challenge is that they'll think you're amazing, and they'll be like, oh, I could never be like you. And I'm always this is you must find this as a trainer. Like the the huge challenge is like. Somebody might say that in passing. Oh, but you've been doing it for a while. I'll be like, no, wait, don't look to prove that idea. Don't yeah. look to prove that idea. And I expect every one of my clients to far surpass me. And I put that idea in their mind. I incept that idea. Like I want to get into their dreams and be like, you can be better than me. You know, <laughs> and it's because these ideas, they can come to ruin you. So if somebody comes and learns from me and they're like, but you're so charismatic on camera, James. I'm not. And I'm like, You'll look to prove that. I'm like, be careful. Do you really want to prove that idea? Because you will. You've got uh, years of terrible videos if you want, if you look to prove that idea. Or what if you have the idea that it's like, actually, it's, it's pretty simple, right? And that you can learn it. And that actually you might just be this diamond in the rough waiting to come out. That's an idea. Why don't we look to prove that idea? Yeah. You know? There's a question I ask clients pretty regularly I think which is what happens if you win that battle because they're, yeah, nice. they're, they're fighting for some for to prove their powerlessness or fighting again that to prove um, their incapability or their unworthiness so I say well what if you win that you know well then mm. and they're like fuck okay so maybe yeah. pick a different battle you know there's you know like exactly as you're saying slightly different language but it's like you know what if you what if you stand up for your worthiness what if you take that on how would that be, you know? I love that. Yeah, Quite I love different. that. <laughs> Powerful. The other thing I want to come back to is is talking about the, the audit. I love you say that. Again, and the humor that goes with it, because, again, in Boundary Boot Camp, it's a four-week course, and I started off saying, well, we don't get to the sexy stuff till at least week three, you know, because the first bit is grueling. It, it literally is an audit. I mean, it, it's like it's it's a... And I'll, you know, this is me selling it, guys. It's grueling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Here's the idea I'm going to prove. Yeah, but 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 it but one of my and I've talked about this on on the show before is like you've got to start where you are because part of that confirmation bias is I believe I'm supposed to be you know let's let's say um, I want to get to Manchester um, and I think I'm supposed to be and I'm willing to believe and use confirmation bias say I'm in London but really I'm in Norwich. <laughs> Then you follow the map from London to Birmingham and you wonder why you end up in York. <laughs> <laughs> so until you actually honestly get where you are, and that's what the first week is about, is like, where am I really? What are the real issues? What are the yeah. problems? Before you can act, then the map works, right? Yeah. Then, you know, then oh, well, I'm not going like northeast for 400 miles. I'm actually going west. <laughs> 
that's so important knowing where you are to begin with yeah is humbling it's painful it's um you know but it's probably the one of the it's actually something i i genuinely try to actively and consciously do about every six months is i'll look at look at my life and i'll go where am i just confirming hey things are great and where you know and and where they're maybe not it's so hard to do that audit but you've got to do it you've got to do it. you know obviously when i do it with people i do it with their businesses and um it's amazing because part of what's beautiful about this work is if if you're attentive you'll actually see the biases without them saying you'll see them physiologically because they will show up so it's like when I say, how's business to people? How's business? And they'll, they'll start to tell me, yeah, we got that. And yeah, often what, what I'll do is, <laughs> yeah. and what, what's really painful is when I just go, well, what do you mean? Like when they'll go, yeah, we're, you know, we're selling, you know, people that might be, say, doing a uh, train, they might be selling training courses or, or events. And, and I'll, they'll go, yeah, so we're, you know, at the moment we're, we're filling events. And, with that. and I'll go, what event? And they'll tell me, and I'll say, how many when you say filling? And they'll tell me. And like the more that you, 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 the more brutally honest I demand them to be, the more you'll see them crumbling. Not in a bad way, but you'll see them being like, oh, yeah, I'm really seeing it now. That can be quite painful. So that's where humor is vital. Mm. That's where humor is vital. It's like when, because I used to do this. Early on in my business, this is the thing about the, the way the landscape has changed. I started my online business 15 years ago, and I was, uh, you know, I've been doing what I do for nearly 20 years now. In my, when I was in my mid 20s, is when I started. And, um, you know, early on in my career, I was maybe earning about 50 grand a year, working every hour. In two, back in 2005, when I first started, when I went from consulting, and I started doing the online coaching and training. I was work. I was coaching every hour, most of them free sessions. And when I actually look at how much I made year one, it was it wasn't that much. You know, it was it, it wasn't that much. And it, you see, our industry is particularly drowned in six figures this, seven figures that. You know. Um, how many clients, this many clients, and, this. and the, the, the surest route through it from, from the work I do is to just say, what do you mean when you say six figures? What do you mean six figures? Because six figures could be $999,000 or pounds, right? Um, or it could be 100,000. There's a big difference there. Yeah. So six figures can mean a lot of things, you know, and also, Depending on your overheads, six figures is not always as impressive as it sounds. I, I had, when I lived uh, the other side of the country from where I am now, I had a friend who, was, who ran a timber yard. That timber yard turned over 1.4 million a year. The guy did not earn enough profit to pay himself. Yeah. So he literally didn't even have a salary. So he was like no profit, like none. He couldn't even pay himself. Like, so I don't even know what that means. I'm not a, an accountant, but it was pretty bad. But the business did 1.4 million turnover. And it was just like, this is, why, this is why it's like, you have to do the truth audit. And all for that to happen, I, I always find this is why people, this is why I've got the reputation for being an ass kicker. It's not that like I'm an ass kicker. I'm not like going, yeah, oh, I'm rubbish. What I'm doing is I, I won't let go. I won't let go of the bone until people look at the reality that yeah. they have. And it's not until you look at, now some people will look at the reality they have and they'll be very happy and they'll go, actually, when I look at it like this, I'm good. And I'll go, great. So what are we, you know, what are we working on then? You know? And sometimes we need that reality hit, that kick up it's, the it's, ass. It's the clarity of what's real. Like you say, it isn't a posit these things are neutral. It's not intrinsically positive or negative. Yeah. It's like, but when you when you get through the fluff and the bullshit and you have the clarity, again, like the map, then you get a real assessment. Well, like. this is why I love numbers. This is why I love numbers. And obviously, I'm using this in the business context. Let me tell you a quick story from today, a time that we're doing this, right? Right. So today, I've just been with a very successful, uh, very well-known. He's got a big fan base. If he does a live video on Facebook, he'll get thousands of viewers. And uh, in the, he's in the spiritual world, funnily enough that we were talking about spirituality. 
and um, uh, I have to be careful how I say this, so I'm not revealing secrets, but uh, what came out was uh, there was there was a membership that this individual sells, and it's doing pretty well. Like it makes, you know, very good money every single month for this person. And, I, and so uh, I'm there to help optimize this. And this is part of the work that I love is like going, let's lay it all bare. Show me the numbers because numbers don't lie. And the great thing is this is where you see people glitching out because their biases can't argue with evidence, you know. Yeah. And this, the, when it comes back to the personal side of biases, this is why I think you've got to gather evidence, you know. But um, as it turned out, I was like, so how many people are, they do a free trial before you then do the membership. They do a free trial first. I said, how many people are taking this free trial? And they're like, I don't know. I was like, but they had the idea, remember, the bias supports the idea. Their idea was, our membership is great. People love it and they sign up all the time. And I was like, let's, let's just get the evidence <laughs> for that, right? And as it turned out, a lot of people do sign up for their free trial. And they gave me a number. And let's just say the number was 300. Actually, I'll give you the exact number. It was 389. I was like, how many of those people go from the free trial to the paid trial? And this is where everyone got a little bit uncomfortable around the table. I was like, go on, find the number. And they were like, okay, we're just going to log in. <clears throat> 75. I was like, all right. So actually, the free trial, we're, we're doing something wrong in that free trial that more than most of people, more than three quarters, don't go past the free trial. And I said, because this is the thing, we came to the day, now I, I'm going to get a little bit complex here, but this is where you see the interrelation of all these biases. We came to the day saying we need to get more people to take the free trial. That was what I was coming to today about, right? So that was the idea that they were confirming. You're here, James, because I, I, whenever I consult with people, I always start just like in, when I'm coaching people, I say, why are we here? Why are we here today? So we had our pleasantries, hey, how you doing, blah, blah, I had our cups of tea and everything, and we sat down, and I went, why am I here? And it's like, we want more people to be in this membership, and so that means getting more people to take the free trial. And I was like, now the minute I hear that, I go, That's a, there's a bias at work there, right? There's an idea that they are confirming. And I went, <clears throat> firstly, before we do this, can we just look at the numbers, you know, and I'll, and I'll look at the evidence. And this is why people either love me or loathe me, right? Or both at the same time. It's well, like, my man. Yeah, he's going to bring out an idea. He's going to bring out our biases, right? And so this number came out. that Like that month, 389 people had taken the trial and only 75 people had stayed on. I said, so with this in mind, sure, we can look at how we can get more people to take the trial, but how about we look at more people who are already taking the trial, seeing it through and, 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 and you know, actually staying on? Yes. It sounds to me like if we could even get another 50 out of those 389 every month to stay on, you'd, you'd have an immediate multiplier without having to spend more money on advertising. We've just got to make them stay on after the trial. And they were like, oh, I was like, yeah, this is retention. This is a retention issue, not an acquisition issue, right? That only came because they were all credit to them. They were willing to look at that. And it was only by looking at that we could go, actually, half of this is just like, let's keep, you know, let's deal with that area. But there's areas in our lives, obviously, this is where you're the grandmaster of this stuff, but there's areas in our lives where we're doing the same thing, where we're going, this is the idea. No, this is the thing that we need to work on. You know, no, no, I need to work on my personal power or whatever it might be. And it's like, actually, that might just be sort of hiding the real area you need to work on, you know? Yeah, I look a lot at red herrings. There's a lot of red herrings happening yes. in personal growth. Um, and people go back to whether they think it's their history, which it may or may not be, but it can be a red herring. Or if yes. only I sort this out, this will happen. Oh, really? Yeah, totally. Similar to you, different context. But it's just asking, really? <laughs> not, yeah. in a, not in a dismissive way, but no, let's really look. Yeah, what's that based on? Because what's that based on is yeah. a really good question for people to ask. Like, well, what's that based on? You know, and that's what I said today, but in a business context, was like, well, you know, James, you're here today because we want to get more people in the membership, so we want to get more people taking the trial. Well, what's that based on? And that usually, if there's an uncomfortable silence after that, it's, well, it's not based on much. <laughs> 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 Whereas I have had clients go, well, it's based on the fact that we know, you know, that if we can get 100 people to take a trial, 
80 people will carry on. So we want more people. Now, if they'd have said that, I'd have been like, great, then yeah, you're right. Yes. Yeah, let's just get more people taking the trial. As it turned out, it was like, no, we need to keep, we need to, what's happening in this trial? You know? Yeah, it's back to that map. They had their ping in the wrong place. 100%. 100%. So James, gosh, we have, we've, we've could talk probably till midnight. <laughs> Um, after that. So if I, I'm going to try, try and sum it up because there's a lot of good stuff, a lot of information there. I think as far as you know, confirmation goes, it, it, you've got to start with an audit. You've got to get real. Have a look at where those confirmation bars, all the different biases operate. Yeah, what's the ideas? And then you'll discover, yeah, what is that sponsoring idea? What is the idea that wants or needs to be confirmed? And then to bring my bit in, if you win that battle, then is that going to have a really bad outcome or a good one? And if, it, if it's if it's going to be a, a shitty outcome, then what is the what is the story that I can incept to use the movie, mm. and then use the confirmation biases positively to confirm support that new story? Then you've got a recipe for sort of turning what can be you know to use the title the pitfalls of confirmation bias and turn them to your advantage. That's and can I add that's where the six seconds of bravery comes in. So if right, you do yeah. the audit properly and you go, well, what is the idea? Then the, 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 the least work you have to do then, dear listeners, is to go, okay, so what's the thing I can do that really only takes six seconds of bravery that will confirm this new idea, this new, better, more empowering idea? Absolutely. Dang, we have just come together with a little formula that will change. If you take this on, dear listener, that could have that just by itself, that little piece can be absolutely life transforming. James, thank you so much for being here today. Um, Bless you, Joel. Thanks. And uh, I want you to tell us, because again, I'm going to really encourage you. If, if you can really resonate with James's wonderful idea, you may or may not, but if you do, you ought to. Let's confirm that idea. Let's confirm the idea that you do. In any case, um, one thing I'd recommend is if you go and find him on Facebook, he does great lives on a regular basis, always entertaining, always insightful. And certainly if you do any kind of business in the sort of healer, coaching, you know, any, anything in that realm, serving people, then, um, then it's going to be great value for you. James, how do they find you? Yeah, come check me out on Facebook. Um, just put in James Labors. There's not many of us. Uh, I think I'm the James Lavers on Facebook, so facebook.com forward slash the James Lavers should should arrive at me. Um, and if you want to check out and get a bunch of cool freebies, uh, come along to jameslavers.com. Uh, there you can. There's loads of things that you can play around with. There we've got a quiz there to find out how industrial age thinking you are versus digital age thinking you are. I've got a free um, uh, app for Apple users. Uh, I've got a bunch of free reports on my site that you don't even need to put a name or email address in. So Radical. we've got some really <laughs> cool stuff there. So yeah, go to jameslavers.com. There's plenty of cool stuff to play around with there. Yeah, there's also some great courses on there. J James has got a whole bunch of courses that you can get. I would highly recommend them. And one last thing, of course, James has his own podcast. I do. It's in its infancy because even though I teach this stuff, um, I face my own confirmation bias of like, oh, man, I better, I better start doing it as well. Uh, so yeah, I've got a, a, a podcast in its infancy that you can check out just and by going to jameslavers.com. Cool. There's a, there's a button up there. It's cool jazz music on it too. So that's always good. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, thanks for being here. Um, Cheers, Joel. we should do this more. Always a pleasure to spend time with you, James and I'll see you well, soon. Man. Thank you. Cheers, man. Cheers.